Hi, this is James Cook of the University of Maine at Augusta Social Science Program, and today we're going to be talking about social networks, a particular kind called an ego network, and the question, why study social networks in the form of ego networks in the first place? So to answer that question, we have to review uh, what ego networks are. Ego networks are a kind of network that stands against uh, a complete network. A complete network is an entire set of nodes and ties within some boundary. Boundary specification within uh, network analysis is a highfalutin term that just means setting uh, the edges of the, of the network between being in the network and out of the network. Who's in? Who's not? Who belongs in the network? Who doesn't? Sometimes a boundary is simple. Uh, it can be the boundary of a community. People who live in the island of Manhattan. Uh, people who serve in the United States Congress or don't. Uh, that's a fairly clear boundary. Uh, sometimes uh, the boundary can be not so clear. Uh, people who like sports. That is a very unclear boundary. And for that reason, uh, sometimes boundary specification is, is a bit of a problem. But if you can be very clear and careful, uh, setting up your boundary allows you then to say, within a network, uh, within the boundaries rather, uh, you can measure everybody inside the boundary, uh, everybody who belongs, and you measure all the ties between all the nodes. An ego network, on the other hand, is a much more modest kind of network in which it is simply a set of ties connecting one ego and ego's alters. Uh, an ego is the individual of whom you ask a qualifying question. Uh, you might ask an ego, who are the people to, with whom you discuss important matters? That's the uh, ego network gen uh, generating question of the general social survey. Uh, you might ask ego, uh, who would you call if your children needed a babysitter? That's another uh, tie eliciting question. Uh, who do you like to play tennis with? That's another tie eliciting question. You start with ego, you ask that question of alters, uh, and then you have an ego network. You continue to ask that question out to a certain network distance, and that uh, determines the kind of ego network that you have. So if we only ask ego that question, and ego names a set of alters with whom ego, say, plays tennis, then we have a level 1.0 ego, ego network in which we just have ego and alters, and the ties just from ego to alters. So it's going to look like a starfish. It's going to look like a star. Level 1.5, representing uh, a little bit of a, an addition, right? Uh, it says, well, let's take level 1.0 and then let's add ties between alters. So uh, if in this case, as you see, alter A and alter E also play tennis together, they will be tied. Alter B and alter C also play tennis together, so they will be seen as tied. Same with alter C and alter D. Alter A and alter D, however, in level 1.5, do not play tennis together, so there is no tie there. Okay. Notice in level 1.0, okay, uh, two things. First of all, every alter that's there has got to be tied to ego, because otherwise they wouldn't be an alter. So there will always be ties from ego in a level 1.0 network and to nobody else. And also notice what is the network distance from ego to all the alters? It's one, right? It's one. That's why it's called a level 1.0 ego network. Well, what about this level 2.0 ego network? Well, okay, now we have our level 1.5 ego network, uh, ties to alters and ties between alters. But now let's say, well, let's ask alters the question. Who do you play tennis with? And let's include all of alters' own alters, including those that are not the alters of ego. And I'm calling these A prime, which is just a kind of standard way of saying it's the next set. So alter A plays tennis with uh, A prime one. Alter B plays tennis with A prime two. A prime three 
is someone who plays tennis with both alters B and C. And A prime four, uh, in this example you see here, plays tennis with alter E. Now, what's the farthest network distance uh, going out from ego to the farthest alter or alters alter? Two. The farthest network distance for a level 2.0 network from ego is two. And that's why it's called a level 2.0 ego network. Uh, level 1.5 simply means, well, uh, we have a network distance of one, and then we add some extra ties in there. It's kind of in between a level one and a level two, which is why it's called a level 1.5 ego network. These are the three levels of ego networks. Why study ego networks? This is our question. Uh, reason number one is that complete networks get very large very quickly. I gave you uh, a few examples of uh, boundary specification for an, uh, 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 a complete network, and one of those wasn't so bad. Uh, all the members of the United States Congress. Uh, if we think about that, though, that's 535 people. It's a relatively small community, actually, as communities go. Uh, because if we think about uh, the typical size of a even a small village, around 10,000 in the United States uh, for a small village. Uh, a moderately sized city, a million people. When we have uh, cities in the United States that are much bigger than that. But imagine just a town of only 10,000 people. And imagine that each person has only five close friends. Then you have 10,000 people and you have 50,000 close friendship ties to study. Now ask yourself, how would you like to go collect all that information? Okay. Uh, it would take you a long, long, long time. And that's only for close friendship. What if you wanted to study acquaintanceships? How many acquaintances do you have? People who you know by name or by face, or you could, you know, call them up on the phone if you wanted and then say, hi, this is so-and-so, and they'd recognize your name. It turns out the list there is actually, for most people, typically is in the hundreds. Imagine that. Hundreds times 10,000. What a big headache. It would take you so long that you as an individual could probably never do it. By the time you finished, all the relationships would have changed and you would have had to start all over again. It's impossible, really, unless you have an army to carry out that kind of study. So the solution that sociologists have in this instance is to create a sample. This is basically to roll the dice and, and just pick a few people to study. Or actually, you know, maybe, maybe a good handful, maybe a hundred people to study. And then you might want to look at uh, their five close friendships. And all of a sudden now you only have 500 pieces of information to gather from 100 people. It's still a lot of work. Imagine yourself trying to do this. A lot of work. But can it be accomplished? Yes. And that can be done with an ego network. You go to each of those 100 people. Those 100 people are your 100 egos, right? And then you ask egos who they know. And you have an ego network for each of the 100 people. That can be accomplished. It's much more manageable. And that's one reason to study ego networks. Because the world is just a big place. The second reason to study ego networks is that sometimes we're not really interested in communities. We're not interested in a whole town. We're really interested in learning something about individuals, perhaps why they do what they do, or why they have a categorization that they have, or why people think of them in a particular way, why they have a label about them, uh, why they have a performance of a certain sort, uh, academically, economically, uh, in terms of their health. So if individuals are interesting, well, you want to study individuals and the immediate social uh, environment around them. What is that social environment? It's their set of ties, or at least that's one kind of environment that you might want to study. And how do you measure that? With an ego network. So uh, it, it also might be the case that um, you're only interested in some kinds of people in a community. Maybe you just want to study the leaders. Maybe you just want to study the artists in a community. Only the teenagers in a community. Teenagers are really interesting, right? They're very different than um, people who are older and younger than them. 
and maybe you want to understand their social environment, so you study them as egos, and you then look at their social environment through ego network analysis. Why stop at level 2.0, you might ask. Uh, I, we explained level 1.0, 1.5, and 2.0, but not going any farther. We could imagine, hypothetically, level 2.5, in which then we could take a look at ego, uh, ego's altars and the ties to those altars, the ties between the altars, and the ties to altars, altars, and the ties between altars, altars. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, one reason to stop at level 2.0 is because that becomes... Um, We've discovered through study a little bit uh, misrepresentative of the immediate social environment of a person. What do I mean by that? I mean that people don't tend to see out that far in their own social networks. They don't tend to know very much about people who are uh, beyond a network distance of two from them. Uh, you see here a reference to uh, a paper by Noah Friedkin, which I'll reference in more detail uh, later in the semester, but uh, in this uh, paper, Noah Friedkin goes and asks people to provide information about what people are doing, uh, who they are directly connected to, and those who they are a network distance of two from, and those who they're a network distance of three from. And it turns out that they're pretty accurate about those to whom they're directly tied. They're only sort of accurate about those uh, who are a network distance of two from them, right? Uh, who they have a, an intervening person that they have to navigate through to get information from. And when it comes to going beyond a network distance of two, people are abysmally inaccurate. Uh, they were only accurate about uh, describing information about people at a network distance of three about 10% of the time in Friedkin study. So at a level 2.5 or level 3.0 ego network, you're measuring uh, contacts that are so indirect that they don't really affect or seem to affect uh, a, a person's behavior, a person's perceptions, uh, and so on. So that's why we stop at level 2.0. Another reason is that it becomes, again, very quickly impractical. So uh, consider this. Ego networks get much bigger at a much faster rate with increasing network distance from ego. Network distance, remember, is the number of intervening ties uh, between ego and somebody else. So if you think about uh, this number C, which is uh, just, it equals the number of alters that a person has. That letter C is just chosen by, in a paper, uh, H. Russell Bernard and, and, and his uh, co-authors in a paper called Estimating the Ripple Effect of a Disaster. We'll get back to that later in the semester. Here's a sneak preview. They find in study after study after study, asking people to name all the sets of people with whom they're acquainted, that in all kinds of places, in all kinds of time, it averages out to 290 people. So what does that mean? If we're interested in acquaintanceships, um, right, the number of people involved at a network distance of one from one ego is 290 people, okay? Uh, at a network distance of two, well, how many people would that be? The simplest way to calculate that is just, well, there's 290 alters and they each know 290 people. That's 84,100 people at a social network distance of two for acquaintanceship. Well, if you wanted to go on, that's a lot, isn't it? Now, if you wanted to go on to a network distance of three for something like acquaintanceship, all of a sudden that would be 24,389,000 people. Now, you'll notice in red, I say that's all from one ego, just one ego. 24,389,000 uh, people. Uh, there's a little oversimplification in there. Think about it, and you may be able to figure out uh, what logical misstep I've taken. Um, H. Russell Bernard, if you look at this paper, will tell you what logical misstep I've taken, but it generally turns out to be about at the right scale, and we'll correct for it later in the semester. So if we are thinking about the people that other people are acquainted with and might contact, it's a huge, huge number uh, if we go beyond two. Even when we go out to two, it's pretty darn big. 
which is why often we'll, we'll find that we don't talk about acquaintanceship in ego network studies. We talk about something a little stronger with a fewer number of alters. Stronger ties lead to fewer numbers of alters. Why does this matter? The news tells us so this very week. Um, this is February 2014. And in February 2014, our President Barack Obama said, we're going to cease to go out to a network distance of three from who? Certain egos. When doing what? Conducting warrantless surveillance of communications. Uh, they had been going out a network distance of three in acquaintance networks, people that had been contacted at this general scale. So when they say, oh, we're just going out to a network distance of three, what does that mean? For every person who was a suspected terrorist, there were roughly 20 million to 30 million people that could have possibly been under surveillance. The power of multiplication is that strong. They are saying now, when, well, we're only going to go out two steps when we do that kind of um, uh, warrantless surveillance uh, through the National Security Agency. Don't worry, for every suspected terrorist, we're only going to be keeping 84,000 people under surveillance. How many suspected terrorists are there? Multiply it by about 84,000 and you have an idea of the reduced scale, which is still a pretty significant scale. The application to uh, finding terrorists and to surveillance uh, is not a hypothetical one. Uh, the NSA, National Security Agency, uh, regime of surveillance and data mining to predict people's behavior is based on ego network analysis, along with some other techniques of social network analysis that we'll consider later in the semester. I hope this has been uh, a good appetizer. I hope that when I've said, oh, we'll get to that later in the semester, you felt a bit impatient that you've wanted to learn more, because you will. Um, and we'll learn week by week about the practical ways in which network analysis matters. Uh, at a more fundamental level, I hope you have an understanding uh, that's a little bit better tonight of why we would want to start studying those ego networks in the first place, what the conditions are under which we do that, um, so that when you're going through and conducting your own ego network analysis, that you uh, don't just feel that you're doing so randomly. There are reasons for it. Ego network uh, analyses have applications and they are important.